And one other announcement, the uh, collection is, take, is going to be taken up, a collection is going to be taken up for the police for the next few weeks. There's a blue box on the back uh, table, and if you'd like to donate uh, to that, uh, just put the money in that box, and every penny of it will go to the police. And uh, hopefully we will be able to attach a testimony or a witness to it somehow. So, okay, let's turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. We want to begin reading in verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, Yet they believe not on him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we have to gather together, to open the scriptures, and, Lord, to hear about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Teach us of him, we pray, in Christ's name, amen. So before we look at our passage in John 12, we're going to have a little review of our fa the past five sessions uh, in the Gospels. And I'm just going to give a, a very, very short review. And the purpose of this review is to put these final words of John in this chapter in a, in a context. Now, we've been looking at uh, the chronological order of the min life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And so that means we have to skip from one book to another because uh, there are some things in his life that weren't mentioned in other Gospels. So uh, we have five different messages the last five weeks, and we've looked at, we've been bouncing back and forth between uh, the different Gospels. So five weeks ago, we looked in Matthew chapter 20, and we noted the healing of the two blind men as Jesus was headed for Jerusalem to be crucified, I might add. And we noted that that was the story of two blind men who, although they were blind, yet they could see who Jesus was. They called him Lord. They attributed to him a messianic title, uh, the Son of David. And what was the response of the Jewish crowds? It says, the multitudes rebuked them told them to hold their peace. And so we noted that that was really the story of two blind men who could see truth and a nation that was really spiritually blind. And that was the point of that healing in Matthew 20. The week after that, we looked in Luke chapter 19, and we looked at the parable of the nobleman who went away into a far country and left pounds with his servants to uh, take care of for him. And we noted how in this parable, it spoke about, it was really a parable about the Lord Jesus, that he was going to leave this world through death, he was going to be with his father, but he was going to come again, and his servants would have to give an account to him. And we noted also in that parable, it said in verse 14 in that section, that his citizens hated him. Now, this is an indictment against Israel. Then we noted in Matthew chapter 21, a couple of weeks ago, and here we have the triumphant or so-called triumphant entry of Christ into Jerusalem. And he entered in with loud applause, and, and they were putting their garments so the, the donkey could walk on them. It was a way of showing uh, respect. But the Lord Jesus knew that all of those words were very shallow and meaningless because that very same crowd would soon be chanting, let him be crucified. So another account of Israel's rejection of her Messiah. The nation was blind, Matthew 20. Uh, the citizens of the country really didn't want Christ to reign over them. They hated him. They said, we will not have this man to reign over us. And then when he did finally arrive in Jerusalem, even though with their mouths they praised him, the Lord knew their hearts were far from him. Another indictment against the nation of Israel. Two weeks ago, we looked in Mark chapter 11. 
And we looked at the account of the cursing of the fig tree. And we saw that that fig tree represented Israel. And when the Lord Jesus was coming back from Bethany into Jerusalem after the uh, so-called triumphant entry, the next day he came back into the city and saw a fig tree. It was covered with nice green lush leaves, and he was expecting to find fruit, but when he got there, it was barren. There was no fruit. And the Lord Jesus cursed that tree, and it withered up right before the eyes of the disciples. And that indicated, again, God's judgment upon that generation of Jews for their hypocrisy and their lack of fruit. Another indictment against the nation of Israel. And this is all taking place in the same time frame. Last week, we looked at certain Greeks, Gentiles, who desired to meet with Jesus. And again, this put Israel in a very bad light because at the same time frame, Israel had the light of the world right in their midst for three and a half years, and they were not interested in coming to the light. And yet, here we see at the end of the Lord's ministry, there were Gentiles, there were these certain men, these Greeks, not Hellenistic Jews, but real Greeks, and they came They had a little light, and they wanted more. They were hungry for the truth. They were seeking after light and more light. And so they came to Jerusalem, and that was their habit. They kept coming for those feast days. They saw something that rang true, or they heard something that rang true in Judaism, and now they knew Jesus was there, and they wanted to meet with him. And yet... When Jesus came to Jerusalem on Passover, the crowds there had very little interest in him. The Gentiles were more interested in the Jewish Messiah than the Jews, another indictment against the nation of Israel. So all of these things were taking place, all of these lessons that the Lord was teaching, and and we find them scattered in the different Gospels, but they all happened around the same time frame when Christ came to Jerusalem around the time of Passover to become the Passover lamb for the sins of the world. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have all different accounts of indications of Israel's rejection of her Messiah. So now we begin in John chapter 12, and we have John's explanation John's commentary of all of these different events, why Israel rejected her Messiah. And he begins by telling us, his readers, how irrational it really was for Israel not to receive Christ. It says in verse 37, John 12, 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, just stop and think of how many miracles. Sometimes we say, Well, the feeding of the 5,000, that was a miracle. That was 5,000 miracles. 5,000 people were fed. They went home to 5,000 different families and told them what happened that day. And they told their cousins and others. And we read also on several occasions where it said, uh, the Lord was healing and the multitudes were healed. All the sick and the multitudes were healed. So there were thousands, not just what we read in the Gospels. There were some of those miracles included thousands of people. And John tells us at the end that the miracles in the Gospels are not a complete documentation of all the miracles that Jesus did. You'd need a, the libraries of the world couldn't hold all those books. So John is going to give his personal but inspired commentary on Israel's unbelief. And isn't that the purpose of John's gospel? He wants, he wrote the book so unbelievers would become believers in Christ. He says at the end in John 20, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So that's why he wrote this book, so unbelievers might believe. Now, in John 12, John is letting his readers know that the nation of Israel didn't believe. Even though Christ did so many miracles, yet they still didn't believe. 
And just think of how the Gospel of John began. It began with, by John exposing the unbelief of, his own, of God's own people. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, like these Greeks that came seeking Jesus, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Israel's unbelief is really hard to explain in light of all the advantages that they had all throughout her history. It seems irrational in light of the preaching ministry of Christ and the 12 and the 70 that had been preaching for uh, over three years all up and down throughout this small piece of real estate. And now John is going to give us an inspired commentary on why Israel finds herself in unbelief. And he lets us know that it was predicted in the Old Testament. Look in John 12 and verse 38 that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. So John is going to quote here from the prophet Isaiah, from Isaiah 53. Now, we're all familiar with that chapter. It's the chapter of Jehovah's servant, who is the Messiah king. And look what John writes. Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? So here, John is quoting from Isaiah 53, a chapter that speaks about the Messiah, but begins by warning his readers of Israel's unbelief. Isaiah predicts that the Jews, even though Messiah comes to his own, they will not receive him. And Isaiah gives his report of the Messiah. That's really what Isaiah 53 is. It's a report of the many important uh, phases in the life and ministry of the Messiah King, whom we know to be Jesus Christ. And Isaiah gives his report by asking two questions. And often that's how Jews try to make statements, by asking a question so you'll think of the answer. And the second question was, to whom uh, whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, Isaiah knows the answer to that question. This revelation came to Israel. Isaiah was a prophet sent to the Jews. So who got the revelation from heaven? Israel did. They had much light. This revelation of the Messiah was given, first and foremost, to the Jews first. That's who it came to. And then the first question was, And who hath believed our report? And this answer, uh, this question is asked in such a way that a negative answer is expected. Who hath believed our report? Not many. That's the implication here. Not many in Israel believed on Christ. And so John's explaining why it is that when Christ came into Jerusalem, not many believed. They had a lot of revelation, but there were few believers in Israel. After the whole three and a half years of Christ's ministry, compared to the number of Jews in the nation at the time, there were very few believers. In spite of the fact that God sent them his son, the greatest revelation of who God is the world has ever seen. They had the light of the world in their midst. They witnessed many, many miracles. They heard countless sermons. They had every advantage imaginable throughout their history, yet the report was given of the Messiah, and they didn't believe the report. And that was consistent with Israel's history. God's Jesus said later, I sent you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify. Some you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That was kind of Israel's history. Their history can be characterized by unbelief. And then look in verses 39 and 40. John goes on to say, Therefore, they could not believe 
because Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. Now here, John is quoting from the prophet Isaiah again. Only he's not quoting in Isaiah 53. Now he's quoting in Isaiah chapter 6. And he quotes a passage that has caused an awful lot of consternation to believers because of the tendency that we have to look at a passage all by itself and rip it out of its context. Isaiah says in that particular verse that John is quoting that the Jews could not believe. And why? Because God blinded them and God hardened their hearts so that they couldn't see and they couldn't understand and they couldn't be converted. And now, is that true? That's what Isaiah said. And of course, we believe every word of Scripture. And it's quite a pronouncement. God smote them with spiritual blindness, and he hardened their hearts so that they wouldn't be able to believe. Now, our Calvinist friends love this passage because it confirms to them their belief that God chooses some to be saved, and he chooses some not to be saved, that God chooses some to be smitten with a hard heart so that they're not able to believe, even if they wanted to, and they cannot be saved. But the Calvinists seem to ignore, in verse 39, the word therefore. It's an important connective here. Therefore. John said, in verse 38, that the Lord sent out a report. He sent out revelation about his son, the Messiah. And then he asked the question, who believed it? And the implied answer was, not too many. Therefore, John now quotes Isaiah 6, therefore God blinded their eyes so that they were not able to see And because they rejected their Messiah, the light of the world, they were not able to understand. God gave Israel advantages and revelation and spiritual privileges that no other nation had. They had more light, more truth, more revelation than any nation on earth. They had more opportunity to believe. And what did they choose? They rejected the light of the world. And they weren't able to see. And that's because when you turn the light out, you cannot see. And look what Jesus says in verse 40. He hath blinded their eyes, God. He hath hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes or understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. And that sounds frightening to me if this verse were taken all by itself. Now look in John chapter 12 and verse 35. Right before this, John said, Then Jesus saith unto them, A little while is the light with you. Now, who's the light? He's he's the light. He's the light of the world. And he said this as he enters into Jerusalem, knowing that it's Passover week, he's going to be crucified. So he says, the light of the world is only going to be with you a little while. And then he says, walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. They will warn. When you have the light, you can see and understand and walk. Once the light is gone, you're plunged into darkness. And that was the warning Jesus gave in verse 35. He says, walk while ye have light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, what does he say to do? Believe on the light. That you might be children of light. Did they have an opportunity to believe on the light? They certainly did. 
He said to believe on the light while they had the light right in their midst because it was going to be much more difficult to believe on the light when the light goes out. It's hard to see in the dark. The light came to to the nation of Israel. He pleaded with them for three and a half. He was with them for 33 years. He pleaded with them for the last three and a half years of his life, traveling up and down all around the country, performing miracles, pleading with Israel to repent. The light of the world was right standing in, standing right in their midst, and Israel's response was, no, thank you. They made their choice. They had an opportunity to believe. And when the light was gone, and by the way, why was the light gone? Because Israel chose to crucify their Messiah. That also was their choice. They said, let him be crucified. Their attitude was, we will not have this man to reign over us. So they chose to crucify their Messiah. They chose to snuff out the light And no wonder they couldn't see spiritually. They lost their spiritual understanding. And so they choose to snuff out the light, and as a result, God blinded them in the sense that there are consequences to turning the light off. If you turn the light off, you're going to be in darkness. You won't be able to see. Christ came to offer them light, and they didn't want the light. They snuffed out the light. And so in what sense did God smite them with blindness? God built in to light and darkness consequences. While you have light, you can make a a good decision. Make it now, he was saying. While you have the opportunity, believe on the light while you're thinking about it, while it's on your mind and on your heart, while I'm right in your midst, because the time is coming when the light will be snuffed out and you won't be thinking about it anymore. And as a result, you won't be able to believe. Now, nobody can blame God for not giving them opportunity. They had the opportunity to believe and they squandered it. And then notice in verse 41, these things said Isaiah. Now, by the way, who is John writing about? through this whole section. The Messiah, Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. He's the one that was speaking. And he says in verse 37, he's the one that performed many miracles and they didn't believe them. So the he here is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we read in in verse 41, these things said Isaiah when he saw his glory, Christ's glory. And spake of him, Christ. Now in Isaiah, whose glory did Isaiah see? He says, I saw the Lord, Jehovah, all caps, Jehovah God. He was high and lifted up, and I saw his glory, or a glimpse of it. John interprets that passage and applies it to Jesus Christ. John says, Isaiah saw the glory of the Son of God. And Isaiah wrote about the Son of God, the Messiah, in Isaiah 53. So Israel sinned against great light. And that's why John wrote the Gospel of John. So that men might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of God. And that's why John wanted, that's why John wrote, he wanted unbelievers to believe on Christ and be saved. And so he's giving us this explanation at this point in the ministry of Christ, his earthly ministry is over, his public ministry is over in this right here. And John wants his readers, now he's written this after the fact, but he wants his readers, Jew or Gentile, to understand and not to make the same mistake that Israel made. The Jews had been given much light, much truth, much revelation, and they didn't believe the report. They said, no, thank you. We don't like, that's not the kind of king we're looking for. 
And Christ said, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you might be children of light. And so at this point in his ministry, John wanted his readers to come to the light like those Greeks. They must have heard something in, in Greece They heard something about the God of Israel, and maybe they were getting discouraged and disheartened over their their empty Greek philosophy and their idols, and and they were searching for light, and and they kept coming back to Israel for those feast days, and then they they sought the light of the world. That's the example John wants to put before his readers, not Israel. Don't follow their behavior. They had light, but they rejected the light. And they were plunged into darkness. And we too should urge people to believe on Christ. While we're witnessing to them. Offer them an opportunity to believe. Because when you're gone, they may never hear that again. They may never even think about it again. But while it's on their mind, while it's on their heart, and the Holy Spirit is working, they have opportunity to respond to that light. When the light is dim. It's much harder to see and understand and believe. Now, look in verse 42. Nevertheless, and this is surprising, nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, the majority of the religious leaders rejected Christ. They rejected the light. But here, John tells us, there was a good number, many of them, not perhaps the the majority, but there was a good number of the religious leaders who were impressed by what Jesus said. And some of those chief rulers, many of them, believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, because of their power, because of their clout, because of the intimidation factor, because of their ability to cancel all opposition, these chief rulers were too cowardly and too afraid to speak up and say, I believe on Christ. And John even tells us why. Because they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They love the praise of God, but they love the praise of men more. So a question arises, were these men genuine believers or not? I don't know. The text doesn't give us enough information to know whether their faith was saving faith or not. John's whole point in his gospel is all you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. These men believed, but James tells us that the devil believes also and trembles. Now, our Lordship salvation folks, they they are sure that these men were not afraid because, but these, rather, these men were not saved because they were afraid, because they were intimidated and too afraid to speak up at that moment. So did they have saving faith? Because they didn't confess Christ publicly, they were afraid to at that moment? I don't know. It's possible they weren't saved. It's possible that they were and they were cowardly. Peter denied the Lord three times. He refused to confess Christ before this young maiden three times, but we know he was saved. But we don't want to judge Peter's salvation by that snapshot of his life. You know, all of us have some pretty bad snapshots. I wish I could burn mine. Some snapshots of life that we're not too proud of. That's one where Peter wasn't proud. These men could have been intimidated at the moment and refused to confess Christ. But if they were genuine believers at some point, it would be manifesting itself. If there's no fruit ever, then they weren't saved. But I don't think we have enough information here to make that judgment. But John adds it just as an interesting little side note to his indictment of the nation. 
And it's almost as if he leaves us kind of hanging here as to whether these men were saved or not. So John gives us his commentary on all the events that were taking place, whether it's the parable Jesus spoke about the nobleman going away or the cursing of the fig tree or the healing of the blind man or the coming of the Greeks, all of these events that happened right around the same time, John interprets it by saying Israel's rejection was really predicted in the Old Testament. So it shouldn't be a surprise to us. But he wants his readers not to make the same kind of mistake that Israel made. And then, after John gives his explanation, the Lord Jesus now speaks, beginning in verse 44 to the end of the chapter, and Jesus makes some exhortations. And so let's look at those exhortations. Christ is exhorting people to believe on him. Now, this section, uh, verses 44 to 50, were all spoken by Christ and It's not certain exactly when and where they were spoken, but John has assembled them together here for us because it serves his purpose in ending the personal, public, earthly ministry of Christ with some exhortations by the Lord Jesus. And again, it's part of the indictment against the nation of Israel. So let's look at what Jesus said and why he said it in this, or why John assembled these quotations in this passage. First, in verse 44, Jesus cried and said, he cries out with great emotion, he wanted everybody to hear this, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. So we have some similar passages to this elsewhere in the Gospel of John. Here John says, if you believe on Christ, you're really believing on his Father. And he says, if you see him, if you see Christ, you see the Father who sent him. So he's saying, in essence, that I and my Father are one. In John 14, in verse 7, Jesus said, to Philip, if you had known me, you should have known my father also. From henceforth you know him and have seen him. If you have known me, Philip, you know the father. We're one. And then in the next verse he says, have I been with you so long and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the father. And how sayest thou then, show us the father? Now notice this. To believe on Christ is to believe on the Father. To know Christ is to know God the Father. To see Christ is to see God the Father. Now, what was the purpose of John's ministry? That we might know who Christ is, and that believing we might have life through his name. So here the Lord speaks of his union with the Father. And Jesus wanted the Jews to know that faith in him was not something different from faith in Jehovah God. And you can understand why, have, if you were brought up in that culture, in that in religious environment, uh, there's only one God, all the other pagan, God, pagan nations, they have many gods, but we are monotheists, there's only one God, and Jehovah God, the Father, is our God, and Jesus now claims to be God. It sounds to them like, are you saying there are two gods? Our faith is to be in you and in God the Father. And Jesus is saying, no. His point was, I and my Father are one. And if you put your faith in me, that is putting faith in Jehovah God. We are not separate deities. And so there are not two objects of faith. To be saved, we don't put our faith in God and then put our faith in Jesus. We're told to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And that is the same as believing on God the Father. So there are not two objects of faith, but one. And so Jews who put their faith in Jesus Christ were not rejecting 
their faith of their fathers in Jehovah God. It's the same thing, and that's what the Lord Jesus wanted them to know, and he cried out with great emotion, this is urgent. So through Christ, the world can know God the Father. Then Jesus says in verse 46, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. Here Jesus is the light that came into the world. And whosoever believes in the light should no longer live in darkness. In other words, if a person comes to the light and gets saved, that means your lifestyle is going to change. You can't live in the darkness and say, I'm a Christian, and this is okay. It's not okay. If we come to the light, then we're to walk in the light. We're to live in the light. Salvation delivers us out of darkness and into the light. Salvation changes a lifestyle. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And as Paul wrote to the Colossians, God hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Just like positionally we've been raised into the heavenly places, not physically, but positionally, that's our home, we have also been translated into the kingdom, though we're not there yet, but it's our position. We are uh, citizens. And so faith in Jesus Christ means salvation is as good as done. If we come to the light, we are coming to the truth. So just think, Jesus has just revealed that if you put your faith in me, it's really putting faith in God. If you know me, you're knowing God. And if you know me, you know light and truth. Jesus said, I am the light. I am the truth, and light represents truth and understanding. And so those that follow after the light, like the Greeks, God will give them more light until they're able to believe on Christ and be saved. So here are two different ways. Through Christ, we can know the Father and believe in the Father. Through Christ, we can know the truth, and we can know the light. Now, thirdly, he says in verse 47, And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus did not come to judge the world at his first coming. And spiritually, it's because the world's already been judged. The world's already condemned. But the purpose of Jesus coming into the world the first time was not to come as a judge, but to come as a savior. He was born to die for the sins of the world, to be the savior of the world. And he said in John three seventeen, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, at this point in Christ's ministry, it was obvious that the nation of Israel had rejected him. And they rejected his offer of the kingdom. And so this meant that the kingdom wasn't going to come at this time. That the kingdom was going to have to be postponed. And if the kingdom was going to be postponed, then those pre-kingdom judgments were also going to be postponed. So John was subtly hinting here that the fact that Christ was being crucified meant that he's going to have to come again. And he's going to have to come again as the judge, as God promised. He wasn't going to be judging at his first coming, but he would be judging at his second coming. You know, up to this point, the Lord Jesus wasn't really trying to explain in great detail the difference between his first coming and his second coming. Why? Because he was making an offer to Israel to receive the kingdom. And he wanted that, kingdom, that offer of the kingdom to be legitimate. 
If he said, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not really going to happen at this first coming, then why offer it to them? So those truths were not revealed until after it was crystal clear that Israel was going to crucify their Messiah. And now John is hinting that Christ did not come to judge the world at his first coming. He came to save the world. He came to be the savior of the whole world or make salvation available to the whole world. And then look in verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. And the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So here the Lord wants his hearers to know that just because they weren't going to be judged by the Lord at his first coming, it doesn't mean they weren't going to be judged at all. They would be judged at the last day. When he comes again in power and great glory, when he comes again to judge the world at the last day, men would be forced to stand before him at the great white throne to be judged by Jesus Christ because the Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son. It's Christ who is enthroned on the great white throne. And in that day, all those that chose not to believe on the light are going to have to stand before the light of the world at the great white throne and be judged at the last day. And what is going to judge them? The very words they rejected. The words that Jesus spoke. You must be born again. They said, no, we don't need to. Come unto me. No, thank you. We're busy. We don't want this man to reign over us. So all the unbelievers who rejected the word of Christ during their earthly lifetime eventually are going to have to stand before him and be judged. In John 3, Jesus said, or maybe it was John, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Here's the word of God that men are going to have to deal with one way or another. We can either believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and have life, or if we don't believe, God's wrath abides on that person. So the revelation of the truth of God in the person of Jesus Christ may be rejected by men in this life, but eventually the words of those of Christ is going to be your judge and bring you into eternal condemnation at the last day. So Jesus said, through him, men can put their faith in Christ, in God the Father. And through him, men can know the light and truth. They can have understanding spiritually. And through him, men can avoid eternal wrath and experience salvation. Christ is the Savior to save men from condemnation. And then finally, Jesus says in verses 49 and 50, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So here Jesus concludes these exhortations with this one thought. My words are the words of the Father. If you've known me, you know the Father. If you believe on me, you believe in the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me speak, you've heard the Father speak. So the Father commanded the Son what to speak. And the Son never spoke independently of the Father. Even in his words, they were one. And when Jesus said this, that God the Father, Jehovah God, gave me a commandment, 
he was saying that, or he was identifying himself with the prophet that Moses predicted would come. And let me just read to you a passage we're familiar with in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, where God says, I will raise up to them a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, like Moses. He'll be a prophet. And I will put my words, my words in his mouth. So when Messiah comes, the Father is going to give him the words to say. That's just what Jesus said at the end of his ministry. My words came from the Father. Just as it was predicted, it happened. And he goes on to say, and he will put, I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So the Father is going to give a commandment unto the Son. That's just what Jesus said. He gave me a commandment. He's the, he's the prophet that Moses predicted would come. The Father gave him the words to say. The Father commanded him what to say. And then Moses goes on to say, And whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of, of him. So the father was predicted that he would give com a command to the son, he would give the words to the son, and the son was to speak them, and that's what Jesus did in Israel. And then God said, if anybody doesn't listen to my word, if they don't pay attention, and by the way, when, when the father spoke of his son, he says, here is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Listen when he speaks. I gave him a commandment. And those who don't, God says, I will deal with them. It says I will require it of, them, of him. It means I will bring legal justice to those who don't hear and don't obey the command of the son. And so there's only one command in the gospel. And that is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And it's mentioned hundreds of times in the Gospel of John, this concept of believing. And so here the Lord Jesus says, and his commandment is life everlasting, in verse 50. So these are the final words in John's Gospel of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he concludes it by talking about life everlasting. That's what he wanted for the world. So just think of these exhortations that, that Jesus gave. If you believe on Christ, you're believing on the Father. If you see Christ, you're seeing the Father. If you know Christ, then you know the Father. And if you know Christ, you can know light and truth and have understanding. And it's through Christ that we avoid eternal condemnation. And finally, it's through Christ that we have life everlasting. So everything comes to us from the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. And so with verse 50, we have the official end of the public ministry of Christ according to John's Gospel. For after this, and by the way, isn't this interesting? Chapter 12, we have the first chapter 12 of John. From 1 to 12, we have the first 33 and a half years of his life. From chapter 12 all the way to chapter 20, we have the last week of his life. So most of the material in the Gospels deals with one week of Jesus' life from this point on. His earthly ministry has finished, and now he's going to bring his disciples, their upper room discourse and other end time discourses that he's going to be teaching uh, his disciples and getting them ready for what's coming. And sometimes they're referred to as the farewell courses, so there's a lot of material, a lot of teaching from the Lord Jesus, but Israel has decided he's in Jerusalem and he's going to be crucified this week. 
not this week. This week in the Bible, you know what I mean. He's done with his people, and he must have been brokenhearted. He knew it was coming. As he looked out over Jerusalem, he wept. He says, if you only knew this time, and they should have known. Daniel told them the exact time Messiah would come, but they didn't know their scriptures, and they weren't ready for this kind of a Messiah king. And they're about to crucify their savior. And so now we're going to see the Lord is going to prepare his disciples for future events, his coming again in power and great glory. So we will end it here with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the life, the ministry, the words, and the works of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would teach us more and more of our Savior. Help us to know him better, that we might know you better. And Father, we pray that we might know more of your plan for us and your plan for the world. And God, we pray that you, through this light and truth and revelation, that we would be better equipped to be your servants and to be your witnesses unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.